In our last session, we talked about the fact that Paul was concerned about those who were held captive by the enemy to do his will. It may be worthwhile for you to kind of flip back into the end of chapter two and review a little bit of those that language that, that is used there, even the imagery of Moses setting the captives free. Because as we get into chapter three, Paul's now going to actually describe what it looks like to be someone who is held captive by the enemy, specifically by the snare of the devil. And in chapter three, what we find is we find this list of a picture. It's a portrait of what it looks like to be someone who's held captive and recognize that this is actually in juxtaposition of what it looks like to be someone who is a captive of Christ or someone who is a follower of Christ. So Paul starts out in chapter three, verses one, uh, going down through verse nine, saying this, understand this, in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Now that word difficulty is used of someone that is, is violent. In fact, we kind of get this picture of the demoniac who is chained and violent because of the spiritual warfare that's taking place in his own mind, heart, and body. And that actually describes this time. There's a time, the last days will come, and they will be filled with times of difficulty. But here's this question that I have for you. When are these last times or last days? Well, if you're going to actually look at the letter that Paul's writing to Timothy, you have to ask the question, does Paul envision that Timothy is living in the last time or the end times? And I want to argue not only in 2 Timothy, but also other places where you find this language. The answer is yes, the New Testament authors, because of the inauguration of the new kingdom coming under Christ, actually viewed themselves and those who would come immediately after them as living in the last days. Those last days were actually prophesied or foreseen by the Old Testament prophets. And the Messiah coming and inaugurating that kingdom was actually the catalyst that started that. Now, how can I argue that from 2 Timothy? Well, you have to ask yourself this question in context. Paul's going to tell Timothy to avoid certain things and certain people. Well, how could Timothy avoid them if he's not living in the same time frame as them? So, so let's kind of ask that question as we move along. But notice, I nor do I want to diminish. Notice I don't want to diminish this, this co construct that says, but it's also going to be like a difficult time. That I actually want to argue Timothy's living in a difficult time. That's part of Paul's concern, is that Timothy needs to continue to stand, to not be ashamed, con to continue to be resilient in the midst of suffering. He needs to continue to speak the good words, even though he can see the chaos and destruction around him, knowing that God's firm foundation stands and God knows who are his, that there's a promise, that there's a, an award that's a, a reward that's coming. So we look at verse two and we notice this. In the, in the last days, people will be, notice this phrase, lovers of self and lovers of money. Now, what we have at the very beginning of this list is we actually have a dynamic to where we have misdirected love. I want you to notice this word love at the beginning of the list. Rather than people who love God and love others, remember the two greatest commands, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor out of, uh, as yourself, coming out of Deuteronomy, as well as Leviticus in the Old Testament. Well, here we have those who are held captive by the enemy to do his work. So it makes sense that if they're held captive by the enemy, they'll also then have a misdirected love. They love themselves and they love money. Now, we kind of have this subcategory that fits in next in the list. This causes them, notice, to be proud and arrogant and abusive and disobedient to their parents and ungodly and unholy and heartless and unappeasable and slanderous and without self-control and brutal and, notice the word now, not loving good, treacherous and reckless and swollen with conceit. And then we have the word love again. And notice here we have this phrase, they love pleasure rather than they love God. So we have this dynamic to where we have misdirected love. They love themselves rather than loving good. They love pleasure rather than loving God. And here's this dynamic of misdirected love. And right in the middle of the list is that word slanderous. If you look at kind of the root of that word, it's the same root word for the slanderer, as in chapter 2, verse 26, the devil. The root word at the heart of this list is the root word for the very one who holds them captive. 
I think Paul does that on purpose. He doesn't come right out and say it, but if you're reading it in the original language, I think this is something that comes out rather clear. This structure, by the way, is actually called a chiastic structure. If you were to look at the Greek endings and the Greek prefixes, specifically the prefixes on these words, what you'll find is that you'll find a pattern that is here. Between these words love, you'll have words that we translate ungrateful, unholy, and you see that little UN that's there? It's trying to tap into the fact that these words have a lot in common with each other. And you might go, great, I don't know that I needed that particular lesson. But here's the picture I want it to paint for you, is that when we are held captive by the enemy, Rather than having our allegiance with Jesus, we are recreated in his image. And it starts with a misdirected love. And it starts then to lead to a slanderous heart toward others. This is what causes them to be proud and arrogant and dis disobedient. Well, when is this going to be? Is this going to be sometime in the future? We might even look at the headlines today and say, well, this is today. And I would say, yeah, it's today. And I would say, but it was also then. Like, this is what Timothy is experiencing. Because notice what we have is these people, rather than loving God, they look like they're holy. They look like they're, excuse me, godly. They want to look like they're put together, but they actually deny the power of godliness. They don't have the heart. And then Paul says, like, avoid these people. Have nothing to do with them. Well, how could Timothy avoid them if they're not like a part of the community? Likely, these are people who are part of the church community who Paul says, when you look at their heart, you can actually start to see their fruit. And you can start to see the fact that they're held captive by the enemy rather than actually having their hearts cleansed like we saw in chapter 2 and ready for every good work in the great household of God. So Paul then is going to actually give more illustrations of what this looks like. Verse 6, among those who are those who creep into the households of, of, of those who are little women is kind of the way Paul actually writes this or weak women. Those women happen to be the women who are burdened by sins and led astray by various passions. They're always learning and they're never able to acknowledge or arrive at a, a position of the truth. Now, what's Paul talking about here? Well, it seems to be there's a situation to where certain people who are now held captive by the enemy are actually finding those who are weakest. Think of warfare imagery. And they're taking them captives to be captives of war. Specifically here, there's a group, apparently a group of those who are uh, women who have certain passions, and yet they want to arrive to a truth. They want to get to a place of good and healthy words like we talked about in the last session, but no one's ever freeing them. No one's setting them free. In fact, they're taking advantage of them. The, the women who are mentioned in this, by the way, are those who are victims to the false teaching. They're not the ones who we look at and go, well, look at them. We actually look at them and we have compassion and pity, almost like a prisoner of war or someone who's being trafficked. Like we look to them and we say, someone needs to set them free. And so Paul looks at the, them and he then uses an illustration from the days of Moses. And he says, you know, Janice and Jambres? And we might go, nope, don't know Janice and Jambres. But Janice and Jambres in Jewish tradition were the two false teachers, the two magi in Egypt that every time Moses went into Pharaoh's court and said, let my people go and tried to free the captives, the, the magicians. Now, they're not mentioned by name in the Old Testament. It's only Jewish tradition that names them. And Janus and Jambres, even the etymology of their name might mean to oppose and to rebel. So they become this, this stereotype, this typecast, this stock image of someone who opposes God's messenger. And, and so we have this dynamic to where they were the ones who were responsible for keeping, keeping the people under slavery, under the enemy. And so Paul uses them as an example, a stock image of those. He says, just as Janus and Jambra opposed Moses, so also these men, notice who the, the characters are that Paul's opposing here, these men who are the false teachers. They oppose the truth. They're corrupted in mind. They're disqualified according to the faith. And they keep going in because they're slanderous, just like the one that they are held captive by. They go and they actually hold other people captive by their lies, by their selfishness. And they do that in these households. Remember the imagery we used in the last session? Catastrophe and chaos and upset versus the foundation of the healthy household of God. That's what's going on here. And Paul says this, they're not going to get very far. Their folly, their foolishness is going to be exposed. It's going to be plain to all the same way that it was to Janus and Jambres. Finally, as Moses through the 10 plagues and then through the Exodus, 
is able to prove God and his word as powerful and true. Now, Paul's concern here then is that these captives who are held captives by lies are able to be set free. And so Paul then says to Timothy, you be different. In the midst of these last days, he uses this phrase in chapter 10, but you, or you, however. And in fact, he's going to use that same phrase in chapter uh, chapter 3, verse 14. It's one of Paul's favorite phrases as he writes to Timothy. They live this way, but you live this way. And so they live this way with misdirected love toward people and misdirected God, uh, toward love toward God. But you live as someone who loves God and loves people. In fact, he says this, you, however, Timothy, you followed my teaching my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings, all of them that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Notice what Paul says. You've, you've been faithful. You, you followed me since the beginning. In fact, remember what we said about remembering? Is that remembering takes us all the way back to the beginning? Paul says, you have followed me since your hometown in Lystra. Don't miss that. Why did Paul pick those three towns, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra? Because Lystra was Timothy's hometown. That's where he made a decision to follow Jesus. That's where he made a decision to follow Paul. And Paul goes all the way back to the beginning and says, you have followed me so faithfully. You have followed Jesus so faithfully from the very beginning. So keep going. Keep following. Be faithful. In fact, he says, even when it's difficult, you followed me, I came into town and it was hard. I was actually under threat of my life. They thought Paul was dead. Go back and read Acts as Paul travels through Lystra. And Paul goes, you knew that it was gonna be difficult. And yet the Lord rescued me from these. The question I have for you when it comes to suffering is this. When Jesus rescues us from suffering, is it kind of this rescue from suffering? Where we're like we get to go around suffering? No, you know this because of the nature of the cross is that we actually are rescued from suffering as we go through suffering. That's the nature of the gospel. It's not that we're going to be rescued and be free of all suffering. It's actually that even as we walk through suffering, there's an empty tomb on the other side. So Paul says, you followed me this way. So continue. In fact, what he says then is this, verse 12, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus are going to be persecuted. They're going to walk through suffering. Well, evil people will actually go on from bad to worse. They're actually going to, we move more toward Jesus and more, more toward Christ likeness. They actually move more towards deconstruction or decreation. They look less like him as they continue their trajectory. In fact, they're going to move from, dece from deceiving to being deceived themselves. But you, coming back here, verse 14, Paul says, you continue. You followed, but you continue. So you keep walking. Like you keep walking along this journey as you take this journey to look more like Jesus. You continue in what you've learned and what you firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. Speaking about the Old Testament, the sacred writings, these sacred writings, the good words are able to make you wise for salvation. Notice in Christ Jesus. How did Timothy come to faith? Was well, mom and grandma spoke the good words, the sacred writings. And when Paul comes and shares with them, that entire family, that entire community, the gospel, it's likely in that context, in that moment, that Timothy, his mom, his grandma, come to a position of faith in Christ because of their familiarity with God's story in the Old Testament, God's word in the Old Testament. Paul says, you followed this. So you continue. You just keep going. Even though things are hard and even though you're walking through suffering, you continue because you know that this is the path of discipleship. So avoid some of this, Timothy. You live differently in contrast. Then we get to verse 16, all scripture. And I actually think that Paul includes what is becoming known as the New Testament. We know it as the New Testament, but New Testament writings. I believe he's including that in this particular term. Why do I say that? Well, he uses this term in another location, and he includes an excerpt, a quote from not only the Old Testament, but also from the gospel of Luke, Luke, who is traveling from him. And he calls it scripture. So I think it's very possible that Luke, Paul is understanding that as the New Testament is being written, that those who are apostles or representatives of Christ are writing words that will be collected and gathered and recognized as scripture. That's part of, by the way, the Jewish expectation with a new covenant era is that when God does something like Moses or like the Exodus or like the exile, 
is that God actually then sends a spokesperson or sends spokespersons and they write down God's plan and God's will and that history. That's what happens in the New Testament. And I think the Jewish expectation was there. I think Paul sees that in this phrase, all scripture. All scripture is sourced by God. It's breathed out by God. It's from him and it's useful. Remember that word good versus the words that are unhealthy or unproductive. It's useful. It's profitable. And we use it for teaching and reproof and correction and training. It's, it's, it's helpful for the positive as well as the corrective. It's, it's helpful for moving people in the right direction to look more like Jesus, but also in the corrective of correcting them and rebuking them and moving them toward Jesus. Scripture is useful for this. And ultimately, this training is done in righteousness to lead us to living rightly. Then verse 17, so that the man of God, the person of God, might be complete, might be equipped for every good work. The word of God like the original words of God that created us, the word of God recreates us into the image he designed us to be in all along. You want to be a kind of person who's equipped for every good work to be the kind of holistic person that is wise and discerning and able to be the kind of person that God has designed you to be. You need to consume his words. You need to, to follow this pattern. You need to recognize that as the same way that God breathed creation into existence, when he breathes out his words, he rebreathes or recreates us in his image. His spirit is involved in this process of recreation. Now, we're going to pick back up on that theme and that concept as we get back into chapter 4, as Paul says, preach the word. But let me back up as we close out this particular session at the end of chapter 3. Chapter 3, Paul has asked the question, so when we come to the last days, as people live this kind of way, with misdirected love, love of self, love of pleasure rather than lovers of God. What will you be the kind of person, even though you walk through suffering, who continues to move and follow as a disciple, continuing what you have learned, following those who follow Jesus, continuing that aim that we all have to look more like him? Will you be more created more into the image of God tomorrow than you are today? And in the context of that, will you also set the captives free? Will you speak those words of truth into a world of chaos so that those who are held captive by the enemy can actually come to a knowledge of the truth? That's the imagery that Paul had of those who were held captive, victims of war. Will you speak truth to them so the shackles can be set free, so that they can recognize the freedom they have in Jesus, the value they have in Jesus, and who God has created them to be all along?